Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, the, uh, by the way, these were just to keep me from rambling for 45 to hours at a time. So uh, it's always, I was telling my wife, it's sort of fun to find out what actually comes out during these. But as we were praying, the door, I, I, I'd like everybody here to receive the promise that God makes in 1 uh, Peter 5, 6, and 7. Remember, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to write these verses. And, and it's really important to embrace this because it's free. It's a deal that is impossible to refuse, and it's a deal that's offered to believers. And those are the verses where the Lord says, Peter is explaining that we are to humble ourselves. He literally says, humble yourself under God, and He will lift you up in due time if if you cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. I don't know about you, but that's the greatest deal you could be offered. Amen. He's telling you that the act of humbling yourself, submitting to Him, is simply giving Him your anxiety, your worries, your cares. So today, let's do that. All right? Let's, let's quit carrying that junk around. And let's take that promise. Because God, you know, He's not like man. He does not lie. He wants us. His son literally died so that we would take advantage of that offer. Okay? And of course, His son's not on the cross anymore. He's alive and well. And he doesn't expect us to be on the cross. So let's get on the cross and get filled with His joy. Amen. That concludes today's message. I will see you next time. All right. Today we're going to talk about the secret to living a life of joy. Okay? And there is a secret to it. In, 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 in the church world, there's a saying that God's grace is scandalous. And it is, because anyone, anyone who professes Christ as the Lord, who believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, shall be saved. That's scandalous. Open to anybody. What type of club is that that has open doors to anybody? And then we also know, we talk in church circles, that God's mercy is immeasurable. It's immeasurable. Because he is willing to continually provide his mercy. And these are great, great words. And they're powerful words. But as believers in Christ, we often keep grace and mercy in the closet of salvation. See, we associate these two words as when we came to faith in Christ. When we first believed, we received his grace and his mercy. And then we take those wonderful gifts... And we put them into the closet of salvation and know we have it and we walk away to live our, our Christian life. That is like being given a Ferrari. A Ferrari. Unlimited gas. All insurance paid for. And parking it in your garage and your cover. See, God wants us to take his grace and his mercy out of the garage. He did. You don't want to have your, your Ferrari in the car and invite your friends to come over and look at it. No, you want to jump in the Ferrari. You want to drive it with the roof down. Yeah. And invite everybody to jump in with you and enjoy the ride. And that's what God's grace and mercy represents to every believer. But we tend to associate it only at that moment of belief. And that harms our walk. See, the first thing we have to do is understand what those two terms mean. Okay? Grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Getting something we do not deserve. Think about that. As children of God, as believers in Jesus Christ, and this, what I'm talking, I'm talking to believers right now. Okay? As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a golden spoon in your mouth. Your father is the wealthiest father in the history of the universe. He absolutely owns everything. He lets us borrow his stuff. He does like us to put it back, by the way. All right? But he lets us borrow his stuff. Okay? He will never throw us out of his family. And our inheritance has no taxes on it. Okay? That is who we are. And, and our father is the ultimate. He's the ultimate father. 
He's, some, of the, some people had awful fathers in this world. I am blessed to have a wonderful dad. Okay? But even my wonderful dad cannot compare to my heavenly father. And our heavenly father, think about it. He's strong. He's protective. He is jealous over us. He's jealous for us. And most of all, he's loving. And he's like that every single day. That handles grace. That's what we have. Mercy. What's mercy? And I looked this one up under Webster's. Didn't go to Wikipedia because I didn't have my computer. I can't spell Wikipedia anyway. So long. It's, a, it's a trouble story. Anyway, mercy means compassion for an offender. Let me repeat that. Mercy means compassion for an offender. The definition of compassion empathy with a willingness to act. See, compassion isn't just feeling sorry for somebody. Compassion is taking action to help them. And that's what mercy is. Compassion for an offender. Think about it. Even though we often offend God, every one of us daily, He still has mercy for us. He still offers us his compassion. He still moves in our favor. Even though we offend Him. That's grace and that's mercy. That's our incredible Father. That is the Lord. That is the Alpha, the Omega. That is Jesus Christ. And every day He extends His grace and His mercy to His children and to those who don't believe. But the more His children, us, embrace His grace and mercy, the more the unbeliever is able to see our Lord reaching out to them in a dark world saying, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. All right. Now I'm going to ask a question. Okay, and I want everyone who, who, to raise your hand if this is you, okay? Everyone in this room who is a Christian, I want you to raise your hand if you quit sinning when you became a Christian. And remember, we are in a church in the lightning capital of the world. <laughs> of course not. Right? By the way, one guy was starting to go up. The lightning thing, you pulled it down. Good choice. All right? Of course not. We are constantly plagued with the desire to do, to do what will feel good, to take a shortcut. We're plagued with that, and we will be plagued until we go home with that. But that's why God provides His grace and mercy to us every single day. But receiving it, taking it out of the closet of salvation, and actually taking it every single day is critical for us having victory in this world Victory described as being filled with God's peace and joy right now. Right now. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you a true story. This is a true story that I believe un about a man who understood God's grace and mercy better than anyone in the history of the world. Okay? And we can debate that all you want. I'm just telling you that I think this man got it. Now, this man was born into a blue-collar family, and he was the runt of the litter. His brothers were strong and impressive. They were the studs of the family. In fact, if you took a portrait of the family, a photograph of the entire family, he would not be the one you'd notice. Okay? If the plane was going down, he'd be the last one to get the oxygen mask, if you know what I mean. Okay? He's not the one everyone thought was going to do anything. But this young man had a heart for the Lord since he was a little kid. And he obeyed his parents, and he even obeyed the birth order. He respected his older brothers. And history show, even shows that this man had a very special anointing on his life. Even though most people couldn't see it. And this man, history also shows, had many, many very public successes and many, many public failures. And it's through those success and failures 
that he is the best example of understanding grace and mercy in the Hebrew Scriptures. If you have a Bible, open it to Psalm 51. If you have a Bible, open it to Psalm 51. And I am speaking, of course, of King David. George, I just saw it. I'm speaking of King George. Okay? Or King, King George, don't mind. King David. That's George. This is David. All right. Now let me set this up because I've talked about this before. Context is critical. When you look at the scriptures, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you and keep things in context, okay? Now, what's been going on is when David was a teenager, many of us know that the Lord anointed him to become the eventual king of Israel. He sent Nathan the prophet, or Samuel the prophet, to his home, and he was anointed. But a very, very, very funny thing happened on the way to the throne. You know what it was? Another anointed king, King Saul, who was a believer, who was also anointed, was not very interested in preparing the way for his successor. And it was by no means a smooth ride for David to his anointed throne. But the difference in Saul and David, both believers, is very basic. Very, very basic. David continued to enjoy God's grace and his mercy. And he exhibited with joy. While Saul, even though he was fulfilling his purpose that the Lord had given him, serving where the Lord had called him to serve, was miserable. Okay? And the whole secret is David got God's mercy and his grace, and Saul did not. My question, rhetorical question for everyone before we jump into this, is what Christian do you want to be? Do you want to be a Christian like King Saul and fulfill your anointing? Or do you want to be a Christian like King David and fulfill your anointing? That's the cross that we're going to walk through today. Okay? Now, by the time David wrote this psalm, let me tell you what it transpired. He'd gone from an obscure shepherd boy to a heart player for the king to a giant killer and war hero. He'd been a loyal and successful general. He was now even, he'd become the king's son-in-law. And then he had become public enemy number one in Israel. He didn't do anything to deserve that. But he'd become <laughs> public enemy number one in Israel. All while continuing to follow the Lord. Okay? At the age of about 30, David finally became king of Israel. And when he became the king of Israel, he led Israel to economic success. He gave them military successes. And most importantly, he led Israel to a spiritual awakening that has probably never been equal even to this day. That's success, isn't it? By anyone's standard. He's following the Lord, and look what's happening. It's been hard, but look what's happening. Well, it's at that point... At that point, we come to Psalm 51. David most likely, what we would call middle age crisis. Okay? But it's not that simple. It's much deeper than that. At this point in his life, David, the military's out doing their thing. David's enjoying the, 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 the flowers of success. Okay? He's at his palace that he's built. It's beautiful. Okay? He has numerous wives. And you know what the Bible calls them concubines? A man had a harem. <coughs> he had a harem. And he's enjoying the fruits of his labor, so to speak. And back then, it was common for kings to do that. It was common. The problem is, is it was never agreeable with God. Ever. Okay? So that's where David found himself as he spots, as we all know, Bathsheba. He's up on his balcony. He spots Bathsheba. You know, what's another concubine? What's another concubine? Big deal. He brings her up. She doesn't disagree. And we know what happens next. Okay? After that, she becomes pregnant. Now, what makes this even more egregious is that David didn't know who she was. She was not only an officer's wife, this officer was one of David's best friends. This officer ate at the king's table. So this was literally going out 
in having an affair with his friend's wife while his friend was out protecting the country. I don't know about you, that's pretty low. Would everybody agree it's pretty low? Okay, how many people have done that? Keep your hands down. <laughs> He's a believer. <clears throat> he is a man who loves the Lord. And he's doing this. And then what happens, we all know the story. She gets pregnant. He goes through all these machinations trying to cover it. Is that a word? It is today. He goes through all these different things trying to cover it. Trying to cover it, trying to cover it. Nothing's working. So finally, out of desperation, he arranges for his friend to be killed in battle. <clears throat> arranges for his friend to be killed in battle just to cover this sin. And it's at that point where God's sort of moving forward, saying, David, you haven't dealt with this, and we're about to deal with it. But there's one part of the story that a lot of people forget. They had a funeral. They had a funeral for Bathsheba's husband. He was a well-known war hero. And at the funeral, David stands up recognizes this man as a great friend, a great hero of Israel, and then points at his pregnant widow and says, I'm going to take his widow as my wife and raise that unborn baby as mine. He said that publicly. And this is a man who loved the Lord. Keep that in mind. This is a man who loved the Lord. Well, that's when, that's enough. The Lord enlightens the prophet Nathan into what's been going on. Nathan goes and confronts David. And what you have in Psalm 51 is literally David's reaction. David's reaction to when he was confronted by the Lord through the prophet Nathan. And I will tell you that what David wrote in this psalm almost 3,000 years ago has been helping believers ever since. Because this explains the power of God's grace and mercy that believers are to walk in every single day. I'm going to read the first three verses from Psalm 51, okay? I'm reading the NET version of it. It is a little bit different, not much. You can almost hear David scream as he writes, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your loyal love. Because of your great compassion, wipe away my rebellious acts. Wash away my wrongdoing. Cleanse me of my sin. For I am aware of my rebellious acts, and I am forever conscious of my sin. It's the first thing David is asking for. Mercy. Mercy. He knows that he has gone against the Lord. He's asking God to have compassion on him. And notice he's counting on God's compassion. God's willingness to act on his behalf. <clears throat> And notice he's not counting on, I did all these wonderful things. Remember the giant? Remember the giant? Remember the giant? He's not doing that. He's completely dependent on God's mercy, God's compassion, and God's loyal love. Because unlike David and us, God's loyal love for us never changes. Ever. And that's what David is laying out. I need your mercy. I need your compassion. It is all dependent upon your love, and I can trust that, Lord. And then I want you to see, he's literally saying, cleanse me of my sin, wash away my wrongdoing. He is asking, this is a man who has been walking with the Lord for probably 40 years, and he's asking God to give me a fresh start. Control, alt, delete. Let's reboot this whole thing, God. That's what he's asking the Lord to do. And he is completely owning his actions. You will never see Bathsheba's name come up in these verses or anything else. He 
knows he did it, and he will not make excuse. Next verse, he says, against you, this verse all by itself is so powerful. Against you, you above all I have sinned, I have done what is evil in your sight, so that you are just when you confront me. You are right when you condemn me. Again, he's acknowledging the truth. Who has he sinned against? It's not a trick question. That's right. That's right. He has sinned against God. The very one who anointed him as a teenager, walked him through victory after victory after victory, gave him the strength to overcome his own fleshly sins, built him up into this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. And then David went out and did that. Okay? David knows that Bathsheba is as much of a victim as anybody else. He did this to God. And this, by the way, have you ever counted the commandments that were broken here? They're actually a pretty good pattern for us to watch. What was the first thing he did? Coveting. He coveted his neighbor's wife, right? Then he followed that with lying. Followed that with, uh, well, actually followed that with adultery. Then came the lying to cover the adultery. And then, of course, finally came murder. Um, the sequel to this sermon is coveting usually is the first domino to fall. We start coveting, and that trips up the rest of them. Okay? So, so David knows that Bathsheba, Uriah, did not cause this, that it was his own lust. His own lust that did this. And David will not try to justify himself at all. And he knows, by the way, he knows he, can, he, knows he deserves condemnation. He knows he deserves hell. He knows that. Okay? That's why he's asking for God's mercy and compassion. Next verse is he says, Look, I was guilty of sin from birth, a sinner the moment my mother conceived me. Look, you desire integrity in the inner man. You want me to possess, to possess wisdom. David's pointing this out, and I know we can take this back to the original sin. That's, that is right, but think about this. David is being honest with the Lord. This isn't the first time. <laughs> David had a long track record of multiple wives and concubines. He had been lusting after women most of his adult life. Let's not just deal with Bathsheba. Let's deal with the fact that I, as King David, have been following the Lord, encouraging people to follow Him, and I, I have been openly sinning. He's getting clean. And he, this is where he's that beautiful, because, Lord, I know that what I was doing was against what you desire. Because I know, Lord, you desire integrity in the heart. And integrity in the heart leads to God's wisdom on earth which leads his people to be able to walk through a really dark and confusing world, making great decisions because we're following the Lord, not the world. And after David's gotten this all off, saying, God, let's not just deal with Bathsheba, let's deal with everything, he asks for the industrial rinse job. The next verse, sprinkle me with water and I will be pure. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And after that, he makes a request that changed his life forever. Remember, he's already the king. He has been victorious. He has already led a massive spiritual awakening to the Lord. Israel has rallied. They are following the Lord. And now David says something that changed the rest of his life forever. Next two verses. Grant me the ultimate joy of being forgiven. Make the bones you crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilt. Our God is awesome. And David knew him. 
And David is saying, I've poured it all out. I'm putting it all out there. Forgive me and let me feel your joy of realizing you've made me clean. Let me not walk around the rest of my life going, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I'm going to go eat worms. No. Get up. Go. Be filled with the joy of knowing your father knows about it, he's forgotten about it, and so should you. Be filled with joy. And that's what he's asking for. He's asking for it because he knows that's the only way he can get through this is by remembering the joy of his salvation. And he can have that every single day. Who else makes a trade like that? God will take all of our pain and all of our guilt and exchange it for joy and rejoicing. Nobody. That's why he's the Lord. And this man knows God so intimately. He knows his character. He knows that God will do this for him because he's finally gotten clean. In the next two verses, you ever heard about, you know, God calling David a man after his own heart? Here's where it comes from. Look what David asked for in the next two verses. Create for me a pure heart, O God. He's been walking with the Lord for about 40 years. Now he asks, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a resolute spirit within me. Do not reject me. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Let me again experience the joy of your deliverance. Sustain me by giving me a desire to obey. And this is why God called him a man after his own heart. Because at this point in David's life, he did it. He did it. Everything in the past was gone, both good and bad. He simply said, I want that part now, God. I want that part now. And God did it. And please remember, this ask is not coming from an unbeliever. It's not coming from a pagan. It's coming from a man of God. A pure heart, a renewed spirit, a determined spirit. You can almost hear him scream, don't reject me. Don't take my Holy Spirit away from me. You know why he probably screamed it? He saw King Saul. King Saul was anointed for that position. God picked him. His specific anointing was to protect the nation of Israel. He did it properly till the day he died. He actually had a good family. You compare it to David's, my goodness. Okay? And he was miserable. Absolutely miserable. So miserable he couldn't see the blessing of David coming to help him fulfill his anointing. He tried to kill it. All because King Saul accepted the grace and mercy of salvation but quickly quit asking for it each day. In fact, if you look at the scriptures, you notice King Saul got to a point where he never made a mistake. It was always somebody else's fault. And thus he wasn't going before the Lord. David had seen that act. He played the harp to that act. He's saying, Lord, I don't want that. I don't want that. And that's the question for everybody here. Whose future do you want? King Saul's or King David's? And this is great too, because David, oh my goodness, unselfish. He always was unselfish. He never had a problem giving things away. But look what he wants to do with this gift. And he's doing it today in this room 3,000 years later. Look what he wants to do with it. Then I will teach rebels your merciful ways and sinners will turn to you. It's powerful. David doesn't want to hoard this grace in the closet. He wants to get the Ferrari out and drive it. Show everybody. Look at what God does. I completely blew it. I blew it. Yet he's forgotten about it. Am I going to go out and do it again? No. Okay. No. 
and you've been filled with joy and you let everybody you meet know, you let every single one of them know that the reason you're joyful is that your God has given you mercy and compassion you don't deserve. He loves you. If Christians are not walking around forgiven, realizing that we have been forgiven and taking that joy of knowing it, we are very unappealing. How are you going to tell people how great the Lord is when you're a sourpuss? How can we tell the Lord how wonderful and joyful, how great our Christ is when we're hiding sin? We end up becoming legalistic, mean, grumpy, and the older we get, the more difficult we are to deal with. As I mentioned, I'll get to it in a minute in a, in a second here, about how this was a changing point in David's life, and you'll see it. You'll see it. Okay? He says, rescue me from the guilt of murder, O God, the God who delivered me. Then my tongue will shout for joy because of your deliverance. O Lord, give me the words, then my mouth will praise you. Again, notice he's begging the Lord to take away the guilt. And I'll say it again. If you have given your sin to God, if you've confessed it, you may be walking with the Lord for 50 years and you've never given something to Him. We're going to do that today. You're going to give it to Him. Yeah. And then you're not going to take it back because you're going to turn away from it. And you, when you hear that voice trying to condemn you for what you've done in the past, you tell Him, talk to the hand. It's the one with the hole in it. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. And notice he wants to shout for joy. Shout for joy. Let my mouth go from a lying mouth that was saying such a horrendous thing at a funeral. Let it go to one that's telling people the truth. That our God is great and our God's willing to do for them the same thing he's done for me. David knows that God's grace and mercy are to be celebrated. Not put in a closet. For everybody needs his grace and mercy every single day, believer and unbeliever alike. And now, now David is clearly going to point out what God actually desires. He says, certainly, certainly you do not want a sacrifice or else I would offer it. You do not desire a burnt sacrifice. The sacrifices God desires are a humble spirit. Humble simply means submitted. Oh God, a humble and repentant heart you will not reject. That's all he wants. It probably has a lot to do with why David, God told David you can't build the temple. Because people will think you're trying to pay me back. No. God doesn't want buildings. He wants our hearts to want Him, to want what is right, and to turn away from what's wrong. That's it. That's all He desires, and David understands that. And David also understands the truth. God knows every single one of us will continue to battle with temptation until the day we go home. And that's why that offer never goes away. You give that sin to me. I'm going to take it away. You turn your heart to me. You take my grace and mercy. You walk out in joy, and I'll give you the strength to keep that sin out of your life. That's what he's talking about. God will never, ever, ever, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. God will never, ever, ever, never, ever, there's seven of those, withhold joy from a believer with a humble heart and a desire to follow him. He just won't do it. That's not who he is. <laughs> then David asks for what has happened, this horrific, horrific sin to impact Jerusalem, Israel. And David had no idea 
that God said, you're thinking too small. This is going to impact the world, David. See, David knows that his sins go in public. He knows it. The George Washington of Israel has fallen badly and he did it to himself. And David doesn't want that to be the story. He wants everyone to know what he did. But he wants the story to be the grace and mercy God gave him. And he knows that the way to demonstrate that is through joy. It's through joy and repentance. <clears throat> he knows that when this goes public and he tells a story, probably read this song, he knows that everybody else in Israel is going to hear this. He wants them to do the same thing he's doing. I know you love the Lord, but it's time to get rid of this stuff. He wants them to get rid of it too so they too can experience the joy, the absolute joy of salvation. And that's why he wrote these last two verses. Be favorably disposed to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will accept the proper sacrifices, burnt offerings, whole offerings, then the bulls will sacrifice, will be sacrificed on your altar. Once we get clean, once Israel got clean, their families got clean, then their neighborhoods got clean, then their nation got clean. And then, then God said, hmm, it smells like good barbecue coming from there. <laughs> because then the worship was real. They were worshiping the Lord from their heart. They weren't worshiping from their lips. That's what God wants. Now, as I told you, this was a, this, this Psalm 51, this was the life changer for David. It's middle age. This is when his life changed. Okay? Because history reveals that the joy of the Lord absolutely returned to David. He absolutely was filled with joy. And history also reveals that God's fair. There were earthly consequences to these sins. There are always earthly consequences. But the scriptures also reveal, have you noticed how David dealt with them? Unbelievable. He dealt with them as God would deal with them. It's incredible. They lost this baby. This baby died. As a father of an infant that lives with the Lord, I, I boldly tell you the truth. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to little ones such as these. That baby went to heaven. That baby didn't need to walk through this world with that on them. Okay, this was public. There would be rebellion in David's own family. There would be rebellion within the nation. Why? Because sometimes we as God's people can be very obstinate. We want to continue to hide what's going on. We become very defensive sometimes. It was tough. But there's something else you've got to realize. Not only did David deal with these things properly, but from this point on in his life, there is never another mention of a concubine or a wife other than one. From this point on in David's life, only one wife is mentioned. Her name is Bathsheba. God took that relationship that had started so wrongly and he took their confessions and he took that marriage and he turned it to joy simply because they humbled their hearts. They humbled their hearts and they turned from their sin. God's grace is scandalous. His mercy immeasurable. By the way, what did he do with that marriage? They had another kid. Solomon got anointed their child, their child to build the temple. God anointed their child, inspired their child to write two of our Old Testament books. Wow. 
Do you think that's a testimony to receiving God's grace, God's mercy? Only God can do that. The other thing, just a small little thing, he also used their child to be in the earthly bloodline of Jesus Christ's own son. Amen. Why are we as Christians not joyful? I can tell you that most of the time it's because we're holding on to something. And the world may say it's okay. Family may say it's okay. But we know in our heart of hearts it's wrong. We know that. And so today, I'm going to ask everybody, I'm going to ask everybody a real question. Do you want to be Saul or do you want to be David? Ladies, just go with me on that. Okay. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads. I'm going to ask everybody here. We're going to take a moment. Please do not pray out loud because believe me, I can't handle what's going on and neither can anybody else. But we're going to take a moment right now for everybody. I don't care if you've been walking the Lord with the Lord for 50 years to get clean. To accept the joy of God's grace and mercy. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We come before you, Father. And we ask for humble and submitted, pure hearts. Whatever it is that you've been holding on to, bitterness, pornography, cheating, Whatever it is that you've been holding on to, judging others, give it to the Lord right now. Give your company to God right now. Give the white lies to God right now. Now receive His grace and His mercy. Realize that from this point forward is different. You are going to walk through this world with the joy of knowing your God says your heart is after Him. Lord, I ask You to anoint everyone who earnestly pray this morning with such a spirit of joy they laugh in their sleep. I ask You to make sure they know You've forgotten completely about it. And they need to, too. And Lord, Lord, whatever circumstances they will deal with, I ask them to be able to do this in your strength to extend your mercy and love. It's in the name of Christ Jesus, the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, we ask these things to be done. Amen. <coughs> All right. Clean a good bath is always good. Happy, joyful. Okay? There's so one other thing I want to give you. About a thousand years later, Jesus told the story. <coughs> some of y'all prayed, some of y'all didn't. Okay? I don't know who's who, by the way. I was looking down. I don't do the thing. I don't know. Okay? But I want to remind you of the story that Jesus told about a thousand years later. He told it about the manager. The manager who was forgiven a debt he could never possibly repay. <laughs> and the story goes, he was real happy. Couldn't believe it. 
and then he walks out the door and he, he will not do the same for someone who owed him much less. Everyone who prayed that prayer, we are to extend the same grace and mercy that God has given us, the same joy to those who have hurt us, to those who owe us. We extend the same thing. We do not hoard what God has given us freely. And, and of course, the manager, by the way, that did that is basically King Saul again. He was tossed in jail. He lost all of his joy and peace. That's why it's so important to not keep God's joy in, but to release it to a world that desperately needs it. Thank you. Yeah.